Okay, we'll get started. We're really glad you're here. As I said before, I'm Mike Wabacker. I'm the director of the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. Tucked way up in Roxborough. I hope a lot of you have been there. Um, you should know that our trails are open, though the visitor center is closed. So do come for a walk. Um, we'll be talking more about some of the trails and some of the impact on climate, of climate change on some of our trails in a few minutes. But, uh, but we're open uh, for the trails, so the visitor center is closed and come for a walk and get some, get some uh, nature therapy. Uh, it's, it's really good for, for stress to be out in nature. Uh, so I'm glad you're all here. I'm going to be sharing my screen in just a minute. We're going to keep you on mute through most of this. Um, and then um, use the chat feature. Everyone knows where the chat feature is um, in Zoom. Everybody's Zoom veterans by now, um, possibly. If you're not, go along the bottom and you can look for the chat, um, the chat icon and click on that. It'll pop up on the right and you can type in a question for everyone. So um, what I wanna do is a little bit different than we've been doing on these Thursday night programs if you've been coming to them. Uh, on these Thursday night live events, we've been introducing you to interesting people in the region who do interesting work that intersects with the Schuylkill Center and our mission. So uh, tonight, um, what I've been doing over the last few years is assembling data on climate change in Philadelphia. And so I wanted to share with you um, information about Philadelphia. What's Philadelphia going to be like? So that's the premise of the evening, and I'm so glad you're here to, to look at that. So um, in a departure from previous uh, Thursday Night Lives, this will be uh, um, mostly a, a discussion by me, a lecture by me, uh, and I'm going to be showing you my screen. Um, but you use the chat feature to ask me questions as we go through. Um, what we'll do is um, I won't be looking at the questions until the end. So when we get through it, I'll go back and look at the questions and, and try to answer them so we can essentially talk through that. Um, we tend to go uh, just over an hour. So we'll slide a little past 8 o'clock if that's all right. Um, you can see Amy Kraus on here. She's our director of communications. She's also going to be our co-host, um, and she'll be helping out as well. So thank you, Amy, for that. All right. So I'm going to share my screen right away. Um, as we jump right in, um, if I can get this right. There we go. But not, I want that one. So everybody see that? We're good? Yay. Yes. So thank you. Tonight is um, Climate Change in Philadelphia, and the title of the talk is Hotter, Wetter, Weirder, which is a signal up front as to um, what's happening to Philadelphia's weather, and which divide into three sections, and we'll cover each of those. Next week, by the way, if I could do a brief commercial message, next week is Night of the Living Moths. Um, so we'll be talking about moths, the cousins of the butterflies, the sort of the much less heralded cousins of butterflies. So everything we want about moths um, a week from tonight. And then two weeks, we've got a first run movie called, um, called The Story of Plastic, which covers the plastic issue worldwide. And um, it's a great movie. Um, we will, if you register for this, we will send you the link. And when you get the link, you watch it on your own. And then on the 30th, join us for a conversation about the movie. So it's an extraordinary movie, a documentary, What's Happening with Plastics Worldwide. That's in two weeks. So, so register, get the link, watch the movie, and join us for the conversation. Um, and it, many of you probably are friends and, and neighbors of the Schuylkill Center. So you, members even, thank you for your support. But uh, we do environmental education programming up in Upper Roxboro for the entire city. We run Nature Preschool, the state's first nature-based preschool, which we can't, we're praying the, the virus allows us to have in-person um, education with our preschool and our educational programming in the fall. Uh, we run the only wildlife rehabilitation clinic in the city of Philadelphia. And we have a really ambitious environmental art program. And we're going to be opening our Earth Day exhibit, which was supposed to be in April for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. We're going to be opening that likely in September um, when you can come and see it. But a piece of the art exhibition uh, that we've got in the building is uh, knitters have essentially knitted climate change. So these are tapestries. Um, so each knitter, there were 38 of them, was given uh, a year 
um, in five-year increments from the 1880s until the current, and they needed the, uh, the highest temperature of that day was assigned to color. And so essentially, you can watch uh, Philadelphia's weather warm um, via knitting, which is really an extraordinary thing to do. So come see them. Uh, we're a membership-based organization. We'd love if you joined. Uh, schuylcenter.org is where you go to that. And for those of you who already are members, thank you so much. We really, really, really appreciate that. All right, we're going to begin with a pop quiz. So we're going to see what you know about climate change. Just a few questions. And I'm actually only going to answer the last one for you. The others we're going to, I'm going to let go and we'll answer them as we go through the talk. So for me, this is one of the most important things every citizen of the world should know how many parts per million are in the air today, now, right now. So 280, 416, or 690. Make a guess, see what you think, tuck it away, write it down, put it in chat, share it with other people if you feel like it. But uh, we'll come to this. So I'm not gonna answer this now, but we'll come to this. Second question for you. Which of our seasons is changing the fastest from climate change? You think it's spring, summer, or winter? And we'll come and see that. So one of those seasons is changing faster than the others. Philadelphia's largest precipitation events, our big downpours, have increased by what percent in recent years? 50%, 180%, or 360%. What do you think? By 2100, Philadelphia's climate will most closely resemble which American city? Richmond? Atlanta? Brownsville? We should do like a Jeopardy version of this. And here's the last question, which is the only one I'm going to answer for you. Which president said, those who think we are powerless to do anything about the greenhouse effect, forget about the White House effect. A president said that. George H.W. Bush, the father, George W. Bush, the son, Barack Obama. And I'm actually gonna answer that one. Because if you guessed A, George H.W., George, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, you're right. He said this in 1988, and I thought this would be interesting to put in here because we'll talk about politics in a second, just a little bit. It's an election year. But in 1988, uh, one, both parties could talk equally about climate change. They disagreed uh, about what to do about it, and they had different names for it, and they had different uh, thoughts about it. But People could talk, that both sides could talk about it. In fact, around the same time, 1988, Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister of England, made her entire staff sit through um, a long workshop on climate change. She wanted her staff to know. So in the years since George Herbert Walker Bush, climate change has fallen in the chasm between Republicans and Democrats. But once upon a time, Republicans could talk about climate change in a, in a very different way. So um, there's that. Okay, we're gonna start getting to some of the data for you. So it's, it's a little data heavy, but this is all information that I want you to see and I want you to know, and the data is presented visually. So I think this is gonna help you in understanding where we are. So again, in the conversations about climate, um, it's good to know what the science is saying. The policy should come from science. So what is the science saying? And given that you've selected to come to a, a lecture on climate change, um, you probably don't need convincing about this. But again, here's what the data says. So um, a year ago, Climate Central released this and showed where 2019 was tucked just underneath 2016 and just above 2017 as the year was progressing for, this is globally, uh, for the warmest year on record. So now we're deep into 2020 and how's it looking? 2020 is even hotter than 2019. So though it's been not so hot in Philadelphia yet, globally 2020 is right up there with 2016. Um, and depending on how the rest of the year shakes out, 2020 may become uh, the hottest year ever. But again, you can see the early industrial baseline at the bottom from 1881 to 1910, the line at the bottom. So that's zero degrees. And this is the percent change since then. And if you look, uh, there's a few years early on uh, that are below that number. So if the, cl if the climate wasn't trending, you would see years go above and below that zero line, some years hot, 
some years cold. But if there's a trend, you, you would see more and more above that. So what we've got now is you know, 1.2 degrees, um, and this is Celsius. Um, so we're about 1.6 actually degrees Celsius, 2.88, almost three degrees Fahrenheit above, uh, above the average right now. And that's very meaningful when we talk about global temperatures. So there we, that's where we are right now. So I asked you how much carbon dioxide was inside the atmosphere right now, was in the atmosphere right now, what are you breathing? And 280 is the historical number that was sort of the pre-industrial revolution. So that was choice A, 280 parts per million. So in other words, if you it made that a percent, the atmosphere is less than 0.03%. So it's three one hundredths of 1%. <laughs> so there's crazy small amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but the, the, the carbon dioxide is very powerful. Through the burning of greenhouse gases, uh, the release of greenhouse gases from the burning of fossil fuels, uh, we are now at 4.6. I'm sorry, 416.39, and that's as of June. So this is current data. You can go to a, a you can go to a website, myco2.org, um, and you can get that number. Um, and that number, sadly, is a 49% increase from the industrial from the beginning of the industrial revolution. So from 280 to 416. Uh, for context, um, here is that same number on a graph that shows the last 400,000 years, which shows we have never been at 416 parts per million of carbon dioxide for more than 400,000 years. In fact, the last time we had this much carbon dioxide was 4 million years ago. So congratulations, we're the only humans to live in a climate with 400 parts per million. So this is a, a pretty big experiment. We'll see how this goes, but there, there we are. So that's, that's some context. Um, there's a lot of science around how do you get uh, 400,000 year old climate data. So if you wanna dive into that, feel free, but there's a lot of science, and a lot of work on how you would get those numbers. One easy answer is you get bubbles of gas trapped in um, ice caps and those bubbles show the, the um, the atmosphere from that time, and you can actually measure the CO2 back then, but that's one of several tricks that scientists are using to do that. But does CO2 have any relevance to temperature? So CO2 is rising. What does that mean for temperature? If you superimpose um, the red graph of temperature on the blue graph of CO2, look what the two of them do. So the two of them track neatly side by side. As CO2 levels go up, Likely not coincidentally, temperature levels go up with it. And of course, you all know a lot of the issues around it, the melting of the ice caps, the issues around polar bears and finding ice flows in food, wildfires across the planet in so many places. Uh, Greta Thunberg, um, the uh, Swedish teenager, um, starts a, a lonely climate strike all by herself, school strike for climate uh, on Fridays all by herself. And within months, she's got kids across the entire planet, uh, wins Time Magazine's Person of the Year Award. Uh, quite a remarkable story and a remarkable kid. Um, I love, <laughs> one of my favorite signs of all the ones I've seen in protests in the top right, you see this one kid wrote, I'm missing my maths test for this. Uh, that child needs a little more help in English, I think, than math. Um, but for me, it's so hard to read signs like save our future and the end is nigh being held up by teenagers who shouldn't have to worry about that. Um, but there they are. And actually, um, what's interesting is that there's a sign between the end is nigh and the math test that says, if you don't act like adults, we will. And I think what's happening now is teenagers are shaming adults into taking action, which God bless them. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit as well. Um, of course, as I mentioned before, it's an election year and, and climate change fell between the cracks, uh, but it fell in the cracks between the parties. Um, so the President Trump has pulled us out of, or wants to pull us out of uh, the Paris Climate Accord. Um, there's a number of steps you would take and oddly enough, coincidentally enough, um, the, the last step is the day after the election. So um, it's gonna be interesting to see how this all shakes out. But there was a day um, a few months ago, back in the fall, I believe, late fall, and early winter, uh, where I was a really happy man because uh, there were a bunch of candidates on the Democratic side who were, for this whole hour, were busily debating the minutia of policy around climate change. 
and I was almost crying. I mean, I'm absurd that way, but I've been waiting 30 years. I've been waiting 30 years for adult politicians to talk about climate change in a meaningful way, and here they were all doing it. So um, if you go to the two websites of the candidates who are uh, running against each other, Joe Biden, of course, has a clean energy revolution and environmental justice plan. He couples clean energy with, with, uh, with justice, which is, which is great. Uh, President Trump um, does have an energy and environmental section of his website. So if you go to his issues page, you'll find this. Uh, but if you can read some of the print in the, right smack in the middle, President Trump announced his intention to withdraw from the US from the unfair parent climate agreement. And to the right, on the right side of one of the boxes, um, the president's hoping to uh, combat wildfires um, in national parks and places by logging them and getting rid of the trees so that there'll be less wildfires. So um, a lot of politics happening right now around climate change, but of course COVID um, and the, the virus and the pandemic have been uh, taking all of the, the front page headlines as it should. Um, so climate change is not being discussed the way it, it might have been without the, the pandemic. One of my favorite cartoons, a lot of great cartoons coming out of uh, climate change, uh, but there's a list of things that we would do if we work to clean energy. Um, and one person says to the other, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Um, so climate change inspires sometimes good cartoons. There's one. All right, so let's get to Philadelphia. What's gonna happen here in the city of brotherly love? Uh, or if I was car talk, I would say our fair city. How, what's gonna happen in our fair city um, with climate change? What's the data say for here? Um, this is an issue of Philadelphia Magazine that came out in November. Uh, cover story, what can a city do about climate change? This, this knocked me out when I saw this. So as somebody who pays attention to these things, I was unbelievably surprised that Philadelphia Magazine, which normally worries about which restaurant has the best hoagie um, or the best hamburger, right? Um, did a full page, of, I mean, sorry, I did a cover story on climate change. Um, with remarkable solutions as to what we, the city could do to combat climate change. And it was in November, by the way. I would have expected them to do this in April in honor of Earth Day. Sort of, uh, it's sort of where, rel where environmental stories are relegated to. So they tackled climate change in November. I was really thrilled. There's an image on the front cover of uh, William Penn underwater. Uh, so it's not gonna be like that, um, but we'll show you what it is gonna be like. Uh, as we get down. So um, the city's Office of Sustainability published a report on climate change a few years back and noticed that since 2010, uh, 10 years ago, we've had the snowiest winter ever, the two warmest summers ever, the wettest day ever, the two wettest years ever, two hurricanes, and two derechos. Derecho? What's a derecho? We're gonna come to that, some of you might know. But for me, climate change is teaching us new language. So um, we'll, we'll cover some of these. So hotter, wetter, weirder. Let's begin with the hotter piece. Uh, what's what's going to happen with our heat um, in Philadelphia? Here's a graph um, that at first glance looks like it's hard to read, but if you just sort of step back and just look at which way the colors are heading, you kind of get the trend, which is what I want you to see. So again, there's that line across the, that, that straight line um, towards the bottom, that's zero. And then everything above it is temperatures changing higher and everything below it is temperatures changing lower. And then if you look for the orange line going like this, that's each year's data point. Some years hotter, some years colder, some years hotter, some years colder. But then again, if you use your statistics that I never took in college, um, you get a trend from that. The green trend line, the green blob to the right is where we go if we have lower emissions. Uh, which is something on the order of two degrees warmer to eight degrees warmer, somewhere in that range. But if we don't do very much and we're in the higher range, we could have temperatures as high as between eight and 16 degrees. So imagine Philadelphia being on average 16 degrees warmer. Uh, we'll talk about that too. But that's one, um, one graph about our heat. Climate Central is great at generating data like this. Uh, the entire country has warmed two and a half degrees since 1970. Pennsylvania, just a little bit less than the rest of the country. But Philadelphia, because of the urban heat island effect, right? We have so much concrete, asphalt, rooftop uh, in the city of Philadelphia. That stuff all warms up and gives up heat. Um, so we're 3.1 degrees. So Philadelphia has warmed more than Pennsylvania 
uh, and more than the rest of the country. So we're more already, since 1970, more than three degrees warmer than we were. And again, one degree is very important um, in, in this climate data. So one degree doesn't sound like much, uh, but it's a, it's a noticeable uptick uh, in climate data. Um, So we're getting more hot summer days, more almost 17 days since 1970 of, of days above normal. So our summers are getting hotter. Um, in addition, there we go. When do we get the first 85 degree day? Um, it's coming two weeks earlier than it did in 1970. So that trend is going in a different direction. The graph is going down like this, but down is not necessarily good in this case. So we used to get the first 85 degree day around May 14th. Now we're getting it around April 24th, around Earth Day. So um, two weeks earlier than it used to. Uh, in Philadelphia Magazine, they had this graph it. Um, this is the average annual number of days in Philadelphia above 90. So historically, about 26 days, almost a month, there would be above 90. Um, the current record is 55 days. By 2080, if some trends continue, 104 days is one prediction. That's almost double the current record, or four times between four and five times what we historically had. So much hotter. Um, days above 95, where it's getting really hot. So almost a full week of days above 95 degrees. So again, we're just getting hotter, hotter, hotter. And here's a really scary graph. By 2100, if some trends, if current emission trends continue, we'll have um, a month, more than a month of days above 100 degrees. Philadelphia will have more than a month of days above 100 um, by the year 2100, if current emission trends continue. Fall's getting warmer too. So 2.6 degrees over this time. But nighttime, oddly enough, is getting uh, warmer than daytime. So night times are staying warmer um, in the fall, which is really interesting and odd phenomenon and counterintuitive. But nonetheless, that's what the data is showing. The first frost is coming uh, more than two weeks later than it used to. Uh, it's a famous old saying about being frost being on the pumpkin. Uh, going to be less frost on less pumpkins. So we used to get frost around Halloween, the first frost around Halloween. Now it's coming deep into November, almost Thanksgiving. So uh, first frosts are coming later as well. Uh, this means with fall being warmer and the frost coming later, uh, the Northeast United States wonderful fall colors may change dramatically. We might not get the color shows that we love and have come to expect. Um, so those fall peeper tours, they call them, people going, driving around looking for um, um, fall colors uh, may change dramatically. So fall, good fall colors needs, uh, water is one thing, but cold nights, uh, kill the chlorophyll off. If we're not getting those cold nights, we're not going to kill the chlorophyll, the green stays, and you don't get the other colors. So that would be disappointing. Which is warming too, but look, 4.4 degrees warmer. So winter is warming more than fall. In fact, for a broad swath of the United States, for like two thirds of the country, winter is the fastest warming season. The entire Northeast, the entire Southeast, and the entire Midwest. Fall, I'm sorry, winter is the fastest warming season. You would think summer would be the fastest warming. That's only true in the Pacific Northwest. And spring is the fastest warming season out in California and the Southwest. Uh, but Winter is warming faster than the other seasons. The corollary is we're getting less snowfall. So again, don't, don't worry about the specific numbers, but that graph is showing that as you get more and more snow, um, as the temperature gets higher and higher to the right, it says DJF temperature, December, January, February temperatures. So as the temperature goes up, the amount of snowfall goes down. In fact, uh, between 1885 and 2010, that's 126 winters when we got with over 20 and a half inches of snow. Uh, that happened 47 times when the temperature was below 34.6 degrees and only 17 times when it was above that. So we're going to get less snow, sadly, for some people. Um, and here is the 30-year average lowest annual temperature. So look at that middle line, about five degrees. That's the long-term average lowest 
annual temperature. So it was the lowest temperature that year. The average for this long time between 1951 and, um, um, and on is about five degrees. For the first 30 years, uh, it was below that, but since 1989, it's been going way up. So the average, and now it's up above eight or nine degrees. So the average lowest annual temperature is increasing too. So Climate Central says that by 2050, the climate in Philadelphia, if current trends continue, will most closely resemble Richmond, Virginia. So we'll have, by 2050, the climate of a southern city. However, by 2100, go 50 years further into that, we will have the climate of Brownsville, Texas. Philadelphia's climate will resemble current Brownsville, Texas in the year 2100. And just to visualize what that means, that's where our temperature is going from 2020 all the way down to 2100. Brownsville, Texas is about as far south in the United States as you can go, tucked right up against Mexico. So that's the trend that we're headed to in 70 years, 80 years, unless some important course corrections are taken. An artist um, took that idea of the tapestries I mentioned earlier um, of the, 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 the people who knitted climate change by assigning a color. And he assigned blues and reds uh, to uh, reds above average, uh, above normal, blues below normal. And if you look at this, uh, we're getting redder and redder to the right. In fact, there's a big cluster of reds to the right and almost no blue with a couple of tiny exceptions to the right. So in recent years, we're, we're very high above average. Um, and if you go back to 1874, look to the far left, you'll see that there's blue years where it's colder, white years where it's normal, and then sort of yellowish years where it's a little bit above normal. Red doesn't really appear until uh, almost a third of the way through, but then lots of red all the way on the right. So that's our, that's our visualization of our climate. That's hotter. Okay, let's check into wetter. What's the wetter piece of this? Um, let's go back to seventh grade science and that water cycle, maybe even fifth grade science, right? Uh, the sun shines down, evaporates water up into the sky. It's, you know, and what goes up must come down. So water goes up, it comes down as precipitation. So guess what? If there's, if there's hotter temperature evaporating more water, guess what happens? So that's as, that's as simple as a fifth grader can understand. It's just, um, we're evaporating more water and there's going to, there's got to be consequences to that. So go back to Philadelphia Magazine between 1971 and 2000, we had 42 inches is our average rainfall, 42 inches. But they're saying by 2080, we're going to get 10 additional inches. 52 will be our average by the year 2080. And again, all of these numbers are all predictions based on lots of things that, that may or may not change. So again, but these are trends based on uh, where we are currently. So um, it's more than a grain of salt, but we have, we have the chance of changing uh, these pathways. Okay, so 10 inches, 10 additional inches of rainfall. And this graph shows the trend in the number of days across the United States where there's rainfall of three inches or more. So check that out. So three inch rainstorms are increasing. Three inches is a lot of rain in one day. So those are increasing in the United States. But again, we're worried about Philadelphia. Um, heavy downpours are increasing by 71% across the Northeast already. So heavy downpours are a big issue in the Northeast, less so other parts of the country, big issue in the Northeast. Wettest, uh, the wettest day of the year um, in 1950 was a nice two inch storm, plus or minus, and now it's almost a four inch storm. So our wettest days are wetter than they used to be. We're getting more rain on those days. Uh, the number of heavy downpours in Pennsylvania is on a steep curve up. This might be surprising for you, but that's, that's changing fast. And this is very hard to read. So I will try to do this. This is, oops, this is the, the top 50 cities in the United States that had the biggest change in percentage of heaviest downpours. Number one is McAllen, Texas, a 700% increase. Uh, in heavy downpours. Portland, Maine, a 400% increase in heavy downpours. But if you can see the fine print, look who's tucked in number three. 
Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is the third, right, number three on the list of 50 American cities with the largest increase in heavy downpours. We've had a 360%, a 360% increase in heavy downpours in, Pennsylvania, in, in Philadelphia. That's crazy. That's, for, of all the numbers I'm sharing with you, uh, for me, that's one of the most startling, a 360% increase in heavy downpours in our city. Can our infrastructure handle that? Um, this is the storm um, from July 10th. I think this is when, when Faye came through and dumped five inches in some places. Um, so this is only on July 10th. Um, and this is up taken up in the Northeast, but there's this concept of a 100 year storm. This is the storm that has a 1% chance of happening um, on in, uh, in, in a year. So in one year, there's a 1% chance uh, that this is gonna happen. So it should happen once in a century, the 100 year storm, storm big enough, right? And in Pennsylvania, that's a 7.5 inch storm. So that's the 100 year storm. Uh, this one came close, but I have seen at least three and maybe five 100 inch storms in, in my adult lifetime, and I shouldn't see one. So we're getting bigger storms, um, and Faye came close. So here's the surprising graph. Um, if you look, you look at the orange and red dots, those are where the top climate hazards are warming and drought. You see that warming and drought are a big chunk of the Midwest and a big chunk of the West, but not a big chunk of the East. Uh, that bright green, that neon green across the entire East, that's precipitation as the top climate hazard by the year 2050. Probably not what you expected, but lots of rain coming too fast, too much too fast. So precipitation, uh, except for the coastline where you see sea level is the number one, um, but all the way down the Eastern seaboard, um, precipitation is the number one concern for climate. That's wetter. Now we're going to get weirder. Let's see what, let's check in with that. In fact, um, what we call climate change has been changing over the years as well. So President Bush, first President Bush called a greenhouse effect way back that was used a lot interchangeably with global warming. And then we shifted into climate change. So we've been changing what we talk about uh, with that as well. So, um, in the, some people have suggested uh, global weirding um, as a, a better phrase because of what I'm about to share with you. But again, there was that early slide I showed you with all the things that have happened only in the last 10 years, including those two derechos, one of whom visited us on June 3rd. This is a photograph of Center City with that derecho above it. A derecho is a huge weather system, uh, supercell thunderstorms, thunderclouds. Um, it, um, it, there's a specific list of criteria you have to meet. It comes from the Spanish word meaning straight ahead. Um, so this is like a straight line of super solid thunderstorms that barrels for like 150 miles. The one that came by us on June 3rd started in Erie, Pennsylvania and went all the way to the Jersey Shore. And it has to generate large wind events. So this thing was crazy. Um, and it just burned, it barreled through the region. And Unfortunately, when it ended, three people had, had died from injuries sustained when trees fell on their houses and cars, including a 49-year-old Roxborough woman who died driving along Belmont Avenue in Bella Kinwood, um, and a, a tree fell on top of her car. But there were 850,000 people on both sides of the Delaware River who didn't have power at the, at the height of the derecho. So um, huge event. Uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, one of my favorite reporters, Anthony Wood, does the weather beat, wrote, for all the mayhem that unfolded Wednesday, it was a prolonged period of tranquility that was an essential ingredient for making June 3rd one of the wildest days for weather in the region's history. One of the wildest days of weather. Meteorologists themselves said they were in awe of what transpired around here from about 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. No one could recall the day in which two extreme wind events were generated by two very different systems. So I don't you remember, we had that derecho on June 3rd. That night, a thunderstorm came right on top of it. And it was the strangest thunderstorm. I was standing on my front porch and, talk, and, and just talking to my wife, I was thunderstruck, good, good pun, um, by the fact that for a full hour, there was continuous rolling thunder. For that hour, it never stopped thundering. And I don't recall so it was like you hear thunder and then you hear thunder. It was just continuous. It was as if uh, hundreds of airplanes were passing overhead. 
I had never heard anything like that. Um, so uh, one of the issues with climate is you can't pin any one weather event on climate change. You can't say that derecho on June 3rd is proof of climate change. Um, you have to stack a lot of data together to get proof. But for me, um, that we've had two of these derechos in the last eight years, the first, the other one was in 2012, uh, two big derecho events, they're very rare events. They, they, they show me, for me, it means there's a lot of energy in the atmosphere. And June 4th is early in the summer. It's not even summer yet. There's a lot of energy, a lot of heat in the atmosphere. And so it, it's generating things like that. But we had that, that derecho and then that thunderstorm on that same day uh, in early June. Um, the derecho plowed through the Schuylkill Center. This is our pine grove where we've got this wonderful couple of acres of white pine trees that we planted in the 70s. It's one of the, the favorite places for people to visit because it's so dark and it smells so great. Um, great wildlife in there as well. But uh, it was like a straight line. The derecho made a straight line through Pine Grove and snapped off at least 20 trees. Um, we actually have closed it off to visitors. You can walk on our trails. We actually, after the derecho, we closed off the trail system for two weeks because we had to make sure no one was going to have a branch fall on them and hurt them as they walk through. Um, we're only, st we're still working on the damage from it. Um, and we've only just, just begun because of there was so much damage everywhere else. We got the trail system back to where we wanted it to be. And now we've pivoted and we're clearing out um, the Pine Grove. Uh, so it'll be open soon. Uh, we've actually started a Pine Grove fund to do some restoration work there. So uh, we're looking for contributions if you want to help out with that. But that derecho essentially sliced right through um, our Pine Grove. And then July 10th, uh, hurricane, no, I'm sorry, tropical storm, be careful, Fay came through, which is itself is not noticeable in what it did, um, except that it's an F storm, right? So it's A, B, C, D, E, F. It's storm number six. Um, so Fay on July 10th is the earliest we've ever had an F named storm ever in climate history. So I don't know what that means for the rest of the season, uh, but we've had six and people were a bit nervous about that. And remember, hurricane season starts on June 1st. The water has to be a certain temperature to generate enough evaporation to create these systems. By July 10th, we've had six uh, in the North Atlantic. So there we go. Um, another article from a little while back, uh, two, I'm sorry, uh, two Novembers ago, um, talked about um, this blast of cold Arctic air in November that set a three, three low temperature records in the city of Philadelphia in November. So again, in the weirding, one of my running jokes as I talk about this is that in the current era, we are setting records for the number of records that we set. So everything is the most, the least, the driest, the wettest, the hottest, the coldest. So the weather is just um, spiraling uh, between all kinds. It's, it's oscillating between extremes. Uh, two Mays ago, we actually had this whole bunch of tornadoes uh, across the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, it was pretty insane. There were 17 um, that year, twice the, the average. Um, and Tuesday, this is a May two years ago, was also the 12th straight day when at least eight tornadoes touched down in the U.S. setting a record. So again, tornadoes need heat. And two Mays ago, we had a lot of heat. The conditions were right. And suddenly, we're spawning to make tornadoes everywhere. And now we're starting to use the word weird um, in weather coverage. So the word weird is popping up. So I didn't just make that up. Um, climatologists, climate scientists, weather writers are beginning to use the word weird in what's happening with our weather. So we're hotter and we're wetter and we're weirder. So you can see this, some of the changes in nature. This is a black vulture who you would not have seen flying through Philadelphia 30 years ago. Um, it's a turkey vulture, its cousin was the one you would see that we now have two species of vultures as a southern vulture has moved north, but that's not the only southern bird who's moved north as well. So animal ranges are changing. Lots of concern among scientists about um, the, the wildflower blooming, they're going to bloom at a certain time. Will the pollinator be there? So if the insect is out of sync with the wildflower, does it get pollinated? So nature is being rearranged in climate issues? Can birds find the bugs that they need 
to stuff down the throats of their babies. So um, we need lots of bugs to pollinate flowers. We need lots of bugs to be feeding all these baby birds. Is that going to be okay? Um, the scott tanager migrates from the Caribbean. Will its migration be okay? Um, so there's lots of timing in all of these events in nature that are that's being rearranged um, with uncertain. And, and there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers as climate shuffles what happens. Those of us here in Philadelphia worry a lot about the Jersey Shore. This is a Superstorm Sandy picture from um, in 2012 when that came through. But um, if you're worried about the shore, we've already had um, between 1990 and 2016, six inches of sea level rise, and we're expected in only the next 13 years to have six more inches, so that in our lifetime, the ocean will have risen by a foot uh, at the Jersey Shore. But that's gonna happen here in Philadelphia too, because we're at the, the place where two rivers meet, the Delaware, which is tidal, and the Schuylkill. So what's gonna happen here? And of course, a lot of industry um, is there right along the river as well, which is a little bit scary. So um, again, this is going to be impossible to read, but just look at the colors on the left. This is from the Office of Sustainabilities uh, from the city of Philadelphia's report on climate change. And you can see the map of Philadelphia is kind of grayish, but look along the coast and you can see the greens and blues. Um, the green is six feet of sea level rise, which is the worst case scenario by the year um, the 2100, yeah, by the year, no, I'm sorry, 2050. Um, gotta get it right, no, 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 right. So the worst case scenario is six feet by 2100, there we go. The middle ground is four feet uh, of sea level rise and that is the blue color and the light green is only two feet. You don't see much light green, but you do see a lot of blue and a lot of green. So essentially, if sea level rises four, which is the moderate prediction, or six, which is the extreme prediction, you're gonna see South Philadelphia and places along the Delaware River, like Independence Seaport Museum, for example, are gonna be troubled. The right is that same sea level rise coupled with a very large storm. So if we get sea level rise and then we get a big storm on top of that, that's what it's gonna look like. And look at South Philadelphia there. So lots of flooding um, in the worst case scenario. And if you start with these on the top left and we'll go clockwise around them, uh, again, this is from the Office of Sustainability's report. So top left is the Schuylkill River on a typical day with the river trail uh, alongside it and the 30th Street Station in the distance, the Sierra Center behind it. Um, to the right um, is Hurricane Irene a few years back, which really inundated things, but then go clockwise and go below the Hurricane Irene photo. And this is gonna be the four foot moderate level of sea rise. If you compare that graphic and go up to the photograph of today, you can see that we're losing a chunk of shoreline between the, Dela between the Schuylkill River and the Schuylkill River Trail. So the trail is still there, the trail is okay, uh, but the land in between disappears. And then if you go to the left, that's the four foot, the fourth photograph, that's the four foot sea level rise in the Schuylkill River with a category one storm and all that land disappears, uh, including the train tracks uh, to the right of the, of the screen. So um, that's the concern is we're getting big storm events and sea level is rising. When the two happen together, what's gonna happen? Here's our airport located, look right above it, on the Delaware River. Uh, nice low land that was nice and cheap, that was nice and flat, great place to put an airport. But sea level rise and there's your airport. So, and four foot is the, is the moderate. So um, the planes are taxiing through water to get to the terminals. So uh, in that Philadelphia magazine that I showed you, they had 10 things with the city community combat climate change, I number one on the list was moving airport. Now, where we do that <laughs> and at what cost, who knows? But that's, that's one uh, recommendation that's coming from them. FDR Park in South Philadelphia looks like this under four feet of water. That's the American Swedish Historical Museum um, at the top right. Uh, you can see this is sort of that little Google pin. That's that museum is gonna be uh, underwater. So FDR Park, uh, which is already on an estuary, is in trouble under this, as is much of Philadelphia. So number one climate hazard for Philadelphia is, like the rest of the state, precipitation. 
more so even than heat. Another hard graph to look at, again, you want to get the gestalt of this and just look back. The purple places are the cooler parts of the city. This is a heat vulnerability index. So the redder it gets, the more the heat is rising. So essentially, look where the red and orange and yellows are concentrated. So essentially, the heat is going to be rising the most in Center City, but then a huge chunk of North Philadelphia and a huge chunk of West Philadelphia. So there is a climate justice component to this, which lots of people, climate justice is a new phrase people are talking about, as black and brown people are going to be impacted uh, disproportionately as the climate goes up and the heat increases. So here, there's a climate justice component that you'll start talking about. 12,000 Americans die from heat deaths every year. That's about the same number of people who are shot by guns, believe it or not. So there's a rough equivalency to that. But as the heat goes up, guess what? So is the death rate from, from heat-related deaths. So this is the number of people per 100, um, per, I'm sorry, per a million people. So currently, like 50 people in Pennsylvania per a million die with heat-related deaths. But again, if we don't do any cuts in emissions, look to the far right, more than 500. So essentially, the number of heat-related deaths in Pennsylvania will increase by a factor of 10 if we don't do something with emissions. By the way, 80% of the people who die from heat-related deaths are above 60. So elderly people, their bodies have lost the ability to regulate heat, and they also are slower in getting the cues that they're hot, they're overheating, or even that they're thirsty. Um, so 80% of those who die from a heat-related death uh, are above 60, so. And this is crazy. Um, but again, if you think about it, it makes sense. Again, this graph is hard to read. Philadelphia is compared to a number of cities, but you can read right in the middle on the right. In Philadelphia, this is somebody who correlated shooting deaths with temperature. So, um, Cold days versus pleasant days versus hot days. So Philadelphia um, is actually the highest on the cities that were studied. So 2.6 shooting victims per day in cold days, 4.4 shooting deaths on hot days. So essentially, um, the hotter the weather gets, uh, the more victims there will be of gun violence as people are angrier and more stressed out by heat. And then another phrase that's coming into lexicon, climate refugees. Uh, this is also reported in Philadelphia Magazine, possibly 300,000 refugees in the city of Philadelphia by the end of this century. So Philadelphia ranks number five in the country uh, behind those four cities for climate refugees. Why? Because New Yorkers and people from the Jersey Shore are going to come to Philadelphia as those, as those areas become inundated. New Yorkers are going to be coming to Philadelphia possibly 300,000 refugees, according to this one study, by the end of the century. All right, so what does all this mean and what do we do about all this? What are the solutions? Um, the Jim Kenney administration wants an 80% drop in greenhouse gases for the city of Philadelphia, what the city can control by 2050, which is great. Uh, Philadelphia Magazine says, let's put a tax on cars coming into the city of Philadelphia and use that tax to refund SEPTA, and so if we can get a more robust mass transit system, we'll need less reliance on cars. Um, so mass transit plays a key solution. Electric cars and getting off fossil fuels are huge. They're coming on strong, not fast enough, but it's, it's happening finally. So we'll finally be driving cars that, that won't need, my kids are in their 20s when they're my age. Um, fossil fuel cars will be long, long, I think from long ago. Um, Philadelphia lights a lot of things at night that it doesn't need to. Uh, we waste a lot of uh, electricity this way. There's lots of thought about how to make the city and its, and its business buildings more, more economical and efficient, more energy efficient. Um, solar power is coming on, so is wind. Uh, there are the wind vanes top left on our football stadium. So as solar and wind ramp up, uh, we can wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. That's happening. The Philadelphia Energy Solutions PES uh, refinery uh, in the middle of South Philadelphia with all those refineries, of course, um, blew up two Junes ago. Um, and was that site was just sold to a new developer, uh, happily, who's going to not um, use it as a fossil fuel site. So this is more than 100 years of fossil fuels here. It's actually going to become a place that's, that's actually more sustainable, which is great.
great and great for the neighborhood there. So that's, that's happening. So there is a movement away from fossil fuels. Is it fast enough? We'll see. Trees, of course, do extraordinary things. They suck in carbon dioxide, they shade the ground, and they absorb stormwater, which is really great. So trees are great with stormwater. So as we get more storms, we're going to need more trees. And Philadelphia has a really ambitious plan for, for planting trees. Um, lots of volunteer opportunities at the Schuylkill Center and many other places to do tree planting. Uh, but tree planting is going to be increasingly important as we move forward. Um, our forest at the Schuylkill Center, 340 acres of trees, absorbs more than 10 million pounds of carbon dioxide and gives off 7.5 million pounds of oxygen. So uh, trees are hugely, hugely, hugely important in the conversation about climate change. Um, we'll finish with Barack Obama. We're the first generation to feel the effects of climate change and the last generation who can do something about it. We kept saying, my generation kept saying that our grandchildren are gonna have to worry about this issue. Guess what? Uh, the timetable has speeded up and it's not our, not even our children, it's us. We have to worry about it right now. So um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and got a bunch of questions here. I'm so glad you did this, this is great. I want to thank Amy for putting in some links. That's great. <laughs> oh, Panita, thank you. Mass is how I said in the UK. See, you try to be, you try to be clever and, and crack a joke and look at that. So thank you. Um, what do I think of a carbon fee as part of a climate solution to reduce carbon emissions by 40% in 12 years if we start now? Yeah, there's lots of conversation about that. Not enough conversation about it. And that was a really live talking point, especially at the turn of the century, like around 2000. Uh, do we do we do a carbon otherwise sometimes called a carbon tax carbon fee? So if you want to burn carbon fine, but you have to pay for it um, There are many many thinkers and writers who say this is a free market solution to solving climate change uh, I don't have a personal opinion about that, but I think it's a it's an incredibly important I think what we're in a place is we essentially have to do almost everything uh, It's kind of we're at kind of an all of the above place State parks are decreasing maintenance of snowmobile trails not bad. Actually, snowmobiles um, have to meet less standards for fossil fuels than cars do. So it would be nice if snowmobiles were electric. Um, the Rodale Institute just held a week-long presentation on no-till farming to decrease carbon leaving the soil and oxidizing into CO2. Yep. They also encourage cover crops to increase soil health and hold carbon in the ground. Yep. So that's, that's hugely important too. So there's there's thousands of players in this field now doing thousands of things. Um, it's really great to watch. And again, as you've seen from the data, the data that we're showing now um, is pretty scary. We'll just, we'll just say that up front. And the trends are happening faster than people expected. And some of that is from feedback loops. So as for example, the Arctic ice melts, oh, let's, let's, let's stick with, um, let's go to permafrost uh, up in Northern Canada. As that melts and the, uh, and the snow cover disappears, you're getting it's compounded by the fact that um, now you've got brown soil um, that absorbs heat. So you've got the snow cover is gone and snow cover reflects heat. So now that heat, that sunlight's not being reflected but then the brown soil is absorbing the heat and giving it off. So you've got sort of a double uh, effect. So you've got a lot of feedback loops like that that are problematic. That's also happening in the Amazon rainforest. As you burn trees, you're releasing carbon dioxide and replacing them with, with, uh, with cows. Um, take the trees away, they're not absorbing carbon dioxide and the cows are giving off methane gases as they belch. And so you've got sort of a triple effect. So one of the things we have to do with that, carbon offsets um, is, I think we should do carbon offsets, absolutely. What type of carbon offset projects are worth investing in? That, unfortunately, I, is out of my, I don't know for sure. I would do a lot of research, but I, I honestly don't know for sure. Is there a way we can see slides for this presentation? I missed the first half entirely. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Um, so we've got this recording. Uh, it's, it's being recorded. I can send you the link. I am Mike at schoolkillcenter.org, Mike at schoolkillcenter.org. Happy to send this to you, happy to hear your comments as well. Um, really intrigued um, if climate change is gonna play any role in the conversation uh, in this presidential election, we'll see. 
Um, I don't know that it will, um, but nonetheless, uh, the next president has a lot of work to do uh, on this issue. Um, let's see, this is an article about loss of habitat and pandemics. Ah, so we've got, uh, Grace has put a link in there as well. Additional questions from you all? And here we go. Thank you, Amy, for your comments and your help. So what I wanted to do, I know that the headlines tend to capture what's happening in the Amazon rainforest and what's happening with polar bears and in the Arctic and Antarctic circles, um, what's happening with wildfires in other places. What I wanted to do was capture some of the data that's happening here in Philadelphia. Um, and I hope that you, you, um, you know, this is useful to you. Um, uh, Kathleen's asking, are we hopeless or do you have hope we can do something? I have hope we can do. Uh, uh, so for me, you know, millions of things are already happening. We need millions of things more to do. Um, one of the interesting conversations I want to have in this circle in the fall is on the Green New Deal, uh, which maybe some of you have heard of. Uh, but of course, the media, as it reports things, has kind of reduced the Green New Deal into kind of a cartoon and people are either for it or against it without knowing what it is. So what I'm hoping to do is assemble a panel who will share with you what exactly it is and is not. Uh, but it's trying to work at the intersection uh, of climate, the economy, and justice, and try to, to solve multiple things. But to be completely honest with you, all of you here, um, given the pace at which the problem is heating up and the pace at which our action is not occurring, what we're backing ourselves into is the probability that a radical program like the Green New Deal might be the only pathway forward because any other pathway forward is not going to do enough. So if we had started working on this 30 years ago and President, the first President Bush talked about the White House effect, if there actually was a White House effect then, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But the fact that um, not even Barack Obama who at least had us in the, the Paris summit, but not even he did enough on climate change as he might have. Um, so he was even disappointed to some people who work in this field. Um, but nonetheless, um, what it reads to me is we are, we are giving ourselves fewer and fewer outs and moderate solutions are not going to do what we need to do to make this work. Um, so it, for me, it reads as we're, we're quickly backing ourselves into a place where something like the Green New Deal might be the only pathway forward. So what is it? What is the Green New Deal? Um, and what does it mean for us? And what does it mean for Philadelphia? Um, ah, yeah. I, sorry to depress you, but it is important that we know this. I know, I know it's hard, but it's, but it's important. Does allowing our front lawn to go native have any impact on climate change? I would say yes, moderately but it has other more important impacts. The one piece of thing that a front lawn does do um, is it has actually no habitat value for any meaningful uh, creatures that share Phil Pennsylvania with us. So if you go native, you're gonna have more diversity of small critters, the critters that feed, uh, that pollinate flowers and feed birds and are food for baby birds. So if you take out your lawn and go native, um, you're going to have that. Uh, uh, native plants need less water, so you're gonna save on water. The, uh, a garden in the front of any kind is a sponge for storm water. And a front lawn, uh, a lawn is almost like concrete. Water sheets along a lawn almost the way that it does across concrete and goes right into the street. So if storm water is our big issue with climate change, a garden is gonna play an, a really important role um, in combating stormwater and, and absorbing stormwater. And if you have some small trees in your front lawn in that lawn, like you might, you might not have room for big trees, but if you do, that's great. But even, you know, dogwoods, modest trees like that, that are native, uh, they will play a role in absorbing carbon dioxide. So there's multiple uh, uh, great things you can do if you remove some lawn. They need less chemical inputs too. You can do a native with no chemical inputs. And uh, the creation of the chemicals that go on front lawns uh, require an extraordinary amount of greenhouse gases. So um, that, that you're also doing that. Are there additional questions on that? And everybody remembers the answers to all those questions. How, how much 
how many parts per million of carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere right now? So you can wow people at the next cocktail party that you don't go to because no one's having cocktail parties anymore. <laughs> oh, this, this is a really important question. Which do you think has greater impact on carbon emissions reductions, individual actions or collective action to enact policy level change? Um, if I was to be completely truthful, the most important change is corporate action. Um, the 10 largest corporations that are greenhouse gas emitters, if they radically change what they would do, the impact is huge. So all of us should do the things that we're doing, absolutely. But the big impact is there. Uh, I think cities and states are doing important work. Um, and those collective actions are really important. Um, but, you know, the world doesn't hinge on a reusable bag. Uh, the world does hinge on, uh, on how Exxon, for example, begins to mitigate what it has done by fighting climate change for 30 years. Um, oddly enough, I was watching King Kong Skull Island from a couple of years ago last night on television, right? I'm just watching King Kong because I hadn't seen it yet. And two commercials come up in sequence. One is Amazon, Amazon, um, is completely going green, um, going with electric vehicles, doing renewable energy projects across the country and the world. And it, it was this whole thing about uh, Amazon's commitment. They didn't quite say climate change, but that was the subtext. It was Amazon's commitment to climate. And the next commercial, the commercial right after it, Burger King. Burger King's commitment to being environmentally beneficial. So, I mean, that's, um, that's really great. Uh, do I know who those top 10 corporations are? No, not, not the top. The Sunrise Movement talks about that a lot. The Sunrise Movement, so if you Google them, you're probably gonna get to it. Um, but the Sunrise Movement um, are those kids, for example, organization of kids, a new green organization of kids who are embarrassing adults like me into doing more important things about climate change. So Sunrise Movement is really phenomenal. And those climate strikers are really great too as well, by the way. So next Thursday, we're doing um, Moss, Night of the Living Moss. We'll do a, a happier subject, Night of the Living Moss. And then two weeks, The Story of Plastics, uh, which is also gonna, it's a hard film to watch, but it, again, it's a really important conversation to have. So I hope you join us then. Um, we're looking at taking a break during August and coming back uh, in September. Um, and we've got uh, beekeepers kicking off our, um, our conversations in September. Uh, so if you want to learn about honeybees and how they dance, share where flowers are. And if you want to become a beekeeper, we can do that as well. Oh, good. Sunrise webinar, Tony put in. So happy. All right. Uh, and yes, going green does produce a possibly greater profit. There's no question. If you're pol creating less pollution, um, right? Uh, there, there's there's savings here, so absolutely. And this is this is a long conversation, um, that um, sort of cartoonish that um, you have to choose between the environment and the in, uh, and and jobs. Um, it's a tired conversation that's been wrong for 30 years, and I think we're finally figuring it out. So actually, the irony is um, that if we go to renewables, there are way more jobs in renewables than there are in coal. So um, so um, coal is on its graceful way out all by itself, irrelevant of what the federal government does. So it's already on its way out. The curve has already been trending down, um, it, um, but there's gonna be more jobs. There's way more jobs in a green economy and everybody who writes about that agrees uh, and that's becoming conventional wisdom, which is really great to see. So I want to thank Amy for her help with this and for her exhortations in the chat. I really appreciate it. I want to thank you all for all of your questions. Hope we see you next week. Um, you, we're going to show you uh, Luna Moths, which are really remarkable. And I'm going to show you a film. Darwin predicts a moth that doesn't yet exist and is discovered 100 years later. So the flower that he was given in the 1800s predicted a moth who was found 100 years later and i'm going to show you the film and it's unbelievable so check out nine other living moths next week um then we got the story of plastics in two weeks um and we have lots of other programming happening across the organization so make sure you check out our schuylkill saturdays uh ask a naturalist all of these things are on our website as well 
if you're a member of the Swoople Center, thank you. God bless you. We really appreciate it. If you'd like to join, you can go to the website and do that too. Love to have your help. Love to have you contribute to the, um, uh, the fund to restore uh, Pine Grove from the derecho. All right. So thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you for all your help. Uh, thank you for the, all the work. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for everything you're doing on behalf of, of the planet. Thank you all. Have a great, great night and, and stay safe and healthy. <laughs>